Hi, welcome. Good morning. Uh, and welcome to our session um, towards a more resilient uh, global health system. Uh, my name is Tycho Onash, uh, and I'll be uh, well, your host this morning. Uh, I come from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, and in my daily life, I build DeepMob, which is a company uh, that builds software for organizations that work with volunteers, so lots of nonprofits, local governments, companies, uh, but also healthcare institutions like the NHS. Um, and why I mention this or why what, what's interesting about this is that what we saw during the pandemic that, you know, this really went through the roof and especially trust in volunteers really increased, uh, especially around health. You know, all these people were quarantined. They needed people to, uh, you know, to help them out with their, with their grocery shopping, people giving uh, credit cards to volunteers to do their shopping for them. Um, and I think that, that sort of brings us to quite an interesting uh, perspective for this session that in many ways, trust in health and the health system uh, has really increased, you know, compared to maybe many of the other sessions that, that, that we've had. Um, so there's kind of two, you know, sort of perspectives that we'll touch on a little bit. So one is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, that trust in healthcare has increased, uh, but there also remains work to be done. Um, so the kind of question is, you know, how can the global health systems, you know, emerge more resilient uh, from, from all of this? And secondly, you know, it's also quite clear that you know, we're now in the 21st century, uh, and that seems maybe a sort of obvious point, but you know, sort of my mind, the, 20, the, the 21st century has sort of started 20 years too late, right? We already had all these fantastic things, you know, these cameras, these studios, uh, but now we're actually using them. Um, so and, you know, that, that means big things uh, for, for, for healthcare and, and health systems too, right? I mean, obvious things are kind of telemedicine, right? Like someone can perform a surgery in Switzerland for you know, some, for a patient in, in, on the other side of the world, um, you know, robots, but also like rapidly decreasing costs of key practices to develop drugs. Um, you know, some things got radically cheaper, which allows us to make, to make new treatments. And then also like the advancements of, uh, of, of machine learning. Um, and um, maybe one thing that, that was sort of about the healthcare system that is quite important to know for maybe our conversation or that took me some time to wrap my head around uh, is that in to develop uh, treatments, new medicines, there's sort of this kind of concept of a 10-year lag, right? So the kind of things we're getting now um, are actually, you know, the kind of medicines we're getting now have been developed, say, uh, 10 years ago, and then they went through this 10-year or 5-year or 12-year period of clinical trials before they would actually, you know, get to the, get to the people. So it's a little bit like you have an iPhone, uh, but you only have the, have the apps of the sort of the iPhone 2. Right, so, uh, so that's that's the reality in in, uh, in, in, uh, in in for healthcare companies and companies like like Novartis. So, without further ado, um, let me introduce the, our guest that has joined us uh, joined us here this morning. Um, Vas Vas is the CEO of, of Novartis since 2018, uh, and for those of you who don't know, Novartis is one of the world's largest medicine producers. Now, during his career at Novartis, um, the company has licensed uh, 30 novel medicines. Uh, and also, he's one of the youngest CEOs of a Fortune 500 uh, company with only uh, 44 years old. Uh, so I think, you know, during our session, we'll have to imagine a little bit that there's like a third person in the room <laughs> that's also 20 years your senior for the kind of intergenerational, you know, dialogue, because we're only like 20 years apart, right? Um, and you know, your vision for Novartis has been one of kind of focus, 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 right? Sort of focusing on those aspects of the business where you can really, you know, make a big impact and you know, leaving some things more, more to the side. It's been one of digital transformation, you know, using much more data science and all these modern possibilities, uh, but also one of culture change uh, and sort of what you call embossing, right? Sort of adding that kind of, uh, you know, American creative flair in the, in the Swiss clockwork, <laughs> I suppose, that, that Novartis is. Um, so just for you, for the audience, uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat. Uh, and, you know, at the, at the end, we can, uh, yeah, we can do some Q&A and, and, and get you involved as well, because that's what what this is about at the, at the Singalan Symposium. So looking very much forward to, uh, to seeing your questions. So Vas, like one, one sort of question to maybe start off uh, with, like your, your background is actually as a, as a physician. Um, so like how, how does a doctor end up becoming CEO and, and how does it help you to sort of reimagine medicine today? Yeah, first, it's great, great to be here, a tremendous honor. And I think learning about the St. Gallen Symposium, it seems like an extraordinary opportunity to connect su such great young leaders on, on important topics uh, of today. Now, in terms of my background, I always refer or think of myself as an accidental CEO. Uh, <laughs> I trained in medicine. The goal was to have a massive impact in public health. I worked 
quite a bit in developing countries on topics like AIDS, TB, uh, and malaria. But, but realized over time that the opportunity was, at least from my own uh, perspective, to have an impact at a broad scale. And how could I inspire a healthier world by leading bigger organizations to innovate and create extraordinary medicines? So that, over time, brought me to Novartis. I've uh, primarily worked in the world of R&D. I've worked in vaccines. I've worked in pharmaceuticals. I even spent some time working on generics. And I find it actually fulfills my life's mission uh, to really enable a healthier world by, by trying to develop these medicines that ultimately reach you know, hundreds of millions of people. Every year, Novartis produces 70 billion doses of medicine that reach 800 million people a year. And hard to imagine having a, an opportunity to shape uh, a bigger impact on public health. So pretty extraordinary. So basically, it's about sort of scaling your work as a doctor to sort of a yeah, another, another, another level. Yeah, I think I think scale. I also think a passion for innovation. I love science. I love mm -hmm. the the challenge of. I mean, you mentioned in your opening comments, drug discovery is a fraught effort. Uh, but when it happens, when you create that miracle of a medicine or a vaccine, this miracle, as we say, that fits in the palm of your hand, and then can impact generations of people in the world, mm -hmm. that's pretty extraordinary. And then the opportunity to bring that to many millions of people. Yeah, I think that's very fulfilling. Yeah. Because I guess that's sort of well, one of these things in, in, in sort of in medicine and, and, and the sector um, that you know, a lot of my friends are, are doctors or I guess, well, they're sort of my age, so they're not doctors yet, right? It's because it takes forever. Um, but, but, um, but sort of once, once, once they're there, they, they sort of realize that it's very hard to sort of get something new done in, in a hospital, right? Like, because the, the sort of surgeon who is 50 is like, well, you've got to learn from me. I mean, so how, how, do, you, how do you do that at, at Novartis sort of as a... That's kind of a well, yeah. Young the, the, I mean, at first, I, I would say I have tremendous respect for patient caregivers, and I think everyone has to find their own source of, of fulfillment. And I think physicians that are able to work one patient at a time equally have an extraordinary impact on on the world. Um, when I think about trying to get change to happen in such a large organization, what I've I've learned is first you have to inspire. You have to start with why, and if you can answer the question why in a very compelling way that already creates so much energy. So that's what we start with the, in, our, in our culture of inspired, curious, and unbossed. We start with inspiration and answering the, the question, why? Um, and then I find in a very complex system, you have to find nudges. I mean, you're not gonna be able to suddenly change 110,000 people that have been working for over 200 years at a company like ours. But what's amazing is when you nudge the system, answering the question, why, empowering people, We've seen a cultural transformation. We've seen a data and digital transformation. And it's happened much faster than I would have imagined on, mm -hmm. on a company of our scale. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's really, really interesting. And I kind of wanted to draw the conversation maybe a little bit to some of the kind of well, big topics in, in, in the world right now, right? Sort of, and, and the, the role that Novartis plays in that, but also a bit like your perspective, because I'm sure that you've got really, really sort of interesting insights on, on some, of these, some of these developments. Um, so for this one, I just kind of, want to maybe take some time to just kind of set it up a bit, but I'm just curious where you'll kind of take it, take it from there. Um, so well, for one, what I mentioned in the introduction as well, right, trust in the healthcare subsectors has increased to this kind of all-time high. Um, but also, um, you know, we see that, you know, lockdowns and, and sort of the restrictions that, that, have, been, that have been put in place in, in, in around the world sort of receive very broad support. Uh, you know, I mean, there are obviously people who sort of are you know, more skeptical about them, but generally, you know, this is sort of what people want, um, which seems to be some sort of, you know, public vote of, of confidence in, you know, we want health, you know, forget about, you know, fine dining and all these other things like we, we want to we want to be to, to, to be healthy. Um, now, also, we saw that, you know, and when in, in March 2020, right, that, that when the lockdowns first started, that politicians were referring to them as, you know, this is war, right? That was mm. sort of one of the things that Macron said. And, and maybe that's sort of politicians' language for saying, you know, we're about to spend a bunch of money. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we developed these vaccines at breakneck pace. So are we at some sort of inflection point for like, you know, really breakout exponential growth in, in, in the health sector? Um, and like, what, what's, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, so a lot there. I mean, first, I would say it's worth taking a pause and reflecting on what an extraordinary accomplishment it is for science-based enlightenment and, and, the, and the progress we've seen in society to have vaccines at the scale and medicines mm -hmm. at the scale that we've had in this pandemic. I mean, we're one, basically one year in, and by the end of this year, my guess is somewhere, or the very good forecast would suggest somewhere between 9 and 12 billion doses of vaccine really good vaccines will get produced in this world. Mm -hmm. 
that is an extraordinary accomplishment. And I think it's a testament to human ingenuity and, and science-based progress. Uh, and it's also worth reflecting, you know, we sometimes forget 100 years ago, life expectancy on this planet was 30, 40 years of age. Most parts of the world, even the poorest parts of the world can get to 70 and in, in wealthier countries over 90. Mm -hmm. So science has definitely delivered in this, in this pandemic. Uh, I, I also think it's a beautiful moment to reflect on the technologies. I mean, we started out with drugs as chemicals, then drugs as proteins. Now we talk about drugs as gene therapies or cell therapies or RNA. I mean, everybody in the world knows the word RNA. <laughs> Who would have imagined a year ago that everyone would know ribonucleic acid as a, as a word? Um, that's, that's pretty amazing. So I do think it's, it's a really exciting moment. The industry's reputation has been rejuvenated by, by the situation. Uh, but that said, there is a second pa uh, epidemic happening right now. I think of it as a syndemic, and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't get enough attention that at the same time the pandemic has taken hold, healthcare systems have fallen behind on cancer diagnosis, cardiovascular diagnosis, diagnosis of so many chronic conditions. And I think this is going to be an interesting moment as we transition out of the pandemic response, hopefully over the coming months. How will healthcare systems rise to the occasion of chronic disease mm -hmm. again? I think there's more sensitivity, there's more interest, but it's going to require, I think, a concerted effort because at the same time, economies need to get rebuilt. You know, of course, entire sectors of the economy are going to have to be rejuvenated. And we're going to have this backlog of patient care that we're also going to need uh, to mm -hmm. tackle. So I think there's a, a lot of dynamics playing out. But the big message is it's the most exciting time, I think, to be in this sector, given the technological explosion and the amount of public interest suddenly in mm -hmm. this work. Yeah. yeah, no, no, I, I see. And, and just before we were chatting a little bit as well, and you were you were mentioning that you know the the the, 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 the that the lockdowns or the sort of you know, the restrictions imposed, and sort of the broad support for these kind of things, maybe indicates a bit that you know we care more about prevention. Um, yeah. could, could you shed some light on on that? Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting thing. So normally in healthcare systems, what we find is uh, patients when they have a disease have a willingness to pay of, of a very high amount of money to, to be able to treat the disease. Healthcare systems at the same time also place a very high value on being able to treat very severe conditions. But historically, prevention, public health measures have been relatively under, undervalued. I find it very interesting that you know, societies were willing to take on very significant economic costs to prevent the first case, to prevent people going to the hospital. What would be tremendous is if this leads to a renaissance in our thinking about prevention, because that's really, in the long run, what's going to allow human societies to get to the next level of, of really better living, healthier living, is if we spend more time pre preventing these, mm -hmm. these diseases. You know, treating a cancer after it becomes metastatic in a patient is an extremely challenging mm -hmm. task. Preventing a cancer is, is something that has so, so much more payback for the patient and for the healthcare system. But one thing that sort of makes me makes me think a bit about with sort of regards to, to to prevention is, I mean, one of these ways to think of hospitals is kind of a sort of this legacy system from the industrial age, right? You sort of you come in there when you have some sort of problem, and then you sort of go through all these <laughs> sort of bureaucratic maze to sort of end up at a doctor who's sort of going to fix your problem or has some sort of solution for your problem. It's a bit like a little factory in a, in, a, in a sense, but. Um, you know, if we're focusing much more on prevention or healthy living or sports and things like that, like, I mean, I can imagine that there's a world where that would not naturally be good for, you know, big pharma companies or big healthcare companies that produce, you know, sort of this, this big system that we have. So, like, what, what's your thought on that? Or is, 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 am, I, am I missing something? Yeah, I think, I think it's an and, not an or. I mean, we'll continue to, of course, make medicines that treat very severe conditions and end-stage cancers and end-stage diseases. But we also see tremendous opportunity in deploying technologies earlier on um, in the diagnostics and diagnosing early and treating early to prevent the onset of disease. We have a beautiful example at the moment. We're trying to roll out uh, uh, sequentially around the world a medicine uh, that can be given twice a year that can prevent, we hope, heart attacks. Mm -hmm. And it's a completely different approach. It's a completely different way of thinking. But the idea is, can we be a partner to healthcare systems to prevent heart attacks, as opposed to having to treat the consequences of a heart attack? Mm -hmm. Now, it requires big shifts in the kinds of medicines that we develop, 
But I think if you look at our industry 20 years out, that's what we have to be about. We have to be much more about partnering with healthcare systems to prevent the, the heavy burden that they face. Right. So you're saying this is like a, it's it's an opportunity. I think so. Anyway, I think so. Uh, that, that's good. To, that's good to hear. And and also one one thing is going to maybe draw this a bit to the kind of the the, the next generation, or I guess or my generation or our generation, is that you know if we're really at this you know inflection point, you know if we're really going to sort of get this sort of huge progress in in, in biotech and in and in, in health, mm -hmm. you know that might also mean something for you know kind of longevity or sort of how long we can we can actually live, right? And I guess I'm sort of a bit more in these kind of you know very techno optimistic sort of forward looking <laughs> communities you know and you know if i will now say you know i can live i, I will hope to live until 150 people think i'm crazy right but yeah. um, but i guess there's sort of very clear opportunities to sort of you know increase the 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 the, the, the span of, of of human life um, is is that something that 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 sort of plays a role in your thinking um, you know, I think I think it, it, there's a lot of work going on in what, what's called senescence, mm -hmm. this, this work on on the science of aging. Uh, our focus, at least my my thinking for our company, and I think the focus um, should be on how can we create healthy aging. Uh, mm -hmm. So some of the work we do is is trying to figure out how can we maintain cognition in the mind, how can we maintain joint health, so that. Um, you know, we can let people live to older and older ages, but in a healthy way, without yeah. without the quality of life declining quite dramatically. Um, now, could we extend life? And now that's a heavy task. It turns out that the uh, evolution has created some some strong mechanisms that beyond a certain point, mm -hmm. it gets really hard. But who knows? I mean, there's people certainly working on it. it. Just happens not to be our focus. Got it. Got it. Got it. And that that's uh, that, that's a very interesting one. I'm um, just just sort of drawing it a bit to the sort of kind of global global perspective a bit too, that, you know, you, you said that when you became CEO that you want to sort of make it one of the top top priorities of the company to build trust in society. Um, what, what, what does that kind of look like in practice for, for a company like Novartis? You know, one of the things we, we, we put as a top five priority for the company is this build trust with society pillar. And it has a few different elements. Probably the, the one we're most passionate about is access to medicines. Mm -hmm. We were recently ranked number one in the in the sector in providing access to innovative medicines. Um, we're quite passionate about it. I'm personally, given my background in Africa and developing countries, very passionate about it. Uh, we recently launched the first sustainability-linked bond last year on access to medicines that actually uh, holds us accountable to reach now 25 million patients as part of our access programs. Mm -hmm. So I think access to medicines is a big part of it. Of course, I'm sure many of your guests have talk, talked about global citizenship topics. So we've committed to be carbon neutral in our own operations and net neutral and by 2030, 2025 for our own operations, net neutral by 2030. But I think to be a responsible global company, it goes beyond uh, the environment. It's mm -hmm. uh, equal pay for equal work. It's uh, parental leave where we have very progressive policies. It's getting to 50-50 in management for women and men in our management levels. It's LGBTI workforce rights. So we've been trying to work on each one of these with the hope that consistency over time will lead to increasing trust. Mm -hmm. But one of the tricky things in any large company, but certainly in our sector, is you have to be really consistent. And trust is lost in an instant. Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes years and years of effort to, to gain. Yeah. So we're working on it. We're trying to be really consistent. But I think what it does is it not only builds stronger relationships with external parties, it also motivates our associates. I mean, I think that pillar of our strategy is by far the most inspiring for our, our 110,000 people. Right, and I can imagine as well for, for a company like yours that if, you know, without that sort of trust in society or sort of what we see now, you know, sort of there's a lot of well, doubts around the, the, the COVID Absolutely. vaccine. Um, and, you know, well, that's very important for you to you know, be able to, to, to have a market in the first place, I guess. And one of the things I was thinking about, I was actually uh, had, a, had a, a cab driver, you know, last week. And I was talking with him a little bit about the, the COVID vaccine and, uh, you know, whether he would take it or not. And he said, well, I mean, I don't really trust it mm. um, because, um, you know, he, and what he said was, you know, we, we've, we've, had, well, we've had cancer for like 30 or 40 years and you know, people dying of cancer, but, but we don't have a vaccine for cancer. Um, but, you know, now all of a sudden we have a COVID vaccine. So I don't, I don't, I don't really, really trust it. And, um, you know, I had quite a, quite, quite a, uh, I was like, well, I maybe, I maybe think it's because of this and this and try to have a bit of a conversation with him about it. But it, I thought it was quite difficult to, to sort of uh, talk to him about that. So I was curious, like, how would you, what would you, what would you say in that situation? 
Yeah, I, I think I think the, the the point you raise of how to increase understanding of science and the scientific process uh, is super super important. And, and you've seen these challenges. My my biggest concern is early next year we're going to have far more vaccines than people willing to take the vaccines in many parts of the world. Mm -hmm. That is going to be our our next crisis. I think we have to remind people and get and create trust that we as companies have to do such rigorous work. I mean, these these vaccines are studied in 50,000, 60,000 patient clinical trials. Mm -hmm. um, but it's difficult to explain, I think, in a, in a very simple way. In this instance, I think I would say to that, that individual that you have to trust that the best scientists in the world have worked tirelessly for a year to rigorously test this, these vaccines. Mm -hmm. And the toughest regulators in the world have said it's safe and effective. I mean, th these are the toughest regulators, FDA, European Medicines Agency, and you know, we take many medicines. We take, you know, hundreds, thousands of medicines mm. uh, from these regulators. And these vaccines have passed the same standard. Mm. So it's pretty, pretty amazing when I reflect on it. But it's one, it's a, it's a, ta it's a challenge we have to keep tackling. Uh, mm -hmm. Scientific literacy in the public. Absolutely. Right. And, and sort of taking that trust, you know, trust from society a bit more towards maybe trust from, from governments. You know, we've had a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, media buzz around this, this sort of topic of, okay, what are we going to do with the IP of the vaccines? Um, you know, with you know, the United States sort of saying, okay, you know, we should sort of open this up for, for the rest of the world, for everyone to produce the vaccines. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I think it's important to take a step back and look at the facts, you know, and, and when I look at it, first, I feel a tremendous amount of responsibility as a global CEO to make sure we get vaccine supply to low and low middle income countries. I co-chair with Bill Gates, uh, the Gates CEO roundtable, where we work solely on the task of expanding access to drug and vaccines and COVID to low and middle income countries. Uh, we as a company, Novartis, we've committed to producing hundreds of millions of doses, many of which will go to the COVAX uh, initiative through our partners, BioNTech, uh, Pfizer, and, uh, and CureVac. Now, when you think about the situation today, what is gonna help? What's really gonna help is opening up supply chains uh, enabling the free flow of goods, the free flow of vaccines. By the end of this year, this industry, as I said earlier, is on a track to produce nine to 12 billion doses of vaccine. By the IP end of this year? Is, this year. IP is not the issue. Um, and I think it's a distraction, this whole discussion, because there are more important things we need to be discussing. Most large companies don't enforce IP in uh, low and low and middle income countries, including our own. So even today, mm -hmm. without this uh, discussion at the WTO, uh, companies in these countries could go ahead and mobilize. The challenge is it takes tremendous scientific know-how to produce uh, products, any, pro any medicine, but particularly uh, RNA vaccines and, and others. Mm -hmm. Knowing as a company, as a vaccine expert and somebody who leads a company that's producing some of these technologies. So I don't think this is the answer. Um, I do worry it's gonna create a tremendous disincentive in the future for small biotechs and startups to work on these uh, technologies for the next pandemic. I don't believe it'll make a difference in this pandemic, but for the next pandemic, the signal is now being sent that uh, perhaps your discovery will be taken from you if you, if you make it at the wrong moment. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to reflect carefully on what are the long-term consequences and what is the science telling us as to what is the current challenge. And I think the science is telling us it's not IP. It's, uh, it's just waiting and having the patience for the scale up and allowing supply chains to move. Mm. No, that's that, that's interesting, and I, I can I can very much see that you know from from an entrepreneur myself, you know that there's there's sort of that that kind of perspective uh, absolutely uh, uh, there. Um, also, kind of bring it a bit back to the to the kind of you know global level on, on you know healthcare and, and kind of biotech. You know, one thing that that sort of I was quite sort of well, triggered by to some extent was this really fast development of vaccines, but also that you know many of them were developed in the West or in Western countries, right? Because if we look at the, the pandemic, you know, we sort of see that Asia and or Australasia, right? Australia mm. and Asian countries have done really well at sort of containing it. And I think there was a lot of, a lot of talk or it still is, right? About, you know, this is gonna be the, you know, the Asian century, you know, like the Chinese have fantastic drones and great airports and trains that, you know, go, go faster than anything we've ever seen. Um, but is, is health and, and, and biotech and, and this sector, is that, is that something that is a, a sort of Western kind of competitive advantage? Is that something that, that is sort of, that, that we are uniquely good at, uh, <laughs> so to say, or what, what's your thought on that? I mean, historically it's taken 
uh, a long time to build what, you know, so-called biotech clusters, clusters of universities, venture capitalists, companies that then become a hotbed of technology, Boston being one of them, San Francisco. Um, to, to some extent, there are a few centers in Europe. I would argue Switzerland, certainly the Basel Valley has been another one. Uh, and so it, over many decades, those clusters have built up, and that's where a lot of the innovation historically has happened. Uh, mRNA came from this kind of German-Swiss cluster, as well as uh, the cluster in, in Boston. I do think it's changing. I mean, I think there's an explosion of energy in Shanghai, for sure, um, when you look at tech startup, biotech startups. There are other clusters forming. I'm very inspired by the work of the African CDC and the African efforts right now to really upscale science in Africa. We are quite committed to that. We do a number of clinical trials and work to train investigators in Africa. But it takes concerted effort over many years to build up that capacity for real discovery innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we should keep working on it because I think it, it not only would help, of course, these economies uh, in low and low and middle income countries, it would enable a virtuous cycle in the healthcare system. Usually when you have science-based innovation happening in medicine, you improve the investigators, you improve the hospitals, you improve the clinical trials, and you get a very positive cycle in these healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that, that's very, very exciting. Um, just like, please keep asking questions in, in, in the chat. We don't see them yet, but it would be great to sort of get some, some audience questions up uh, uh, as well soon. So please keep, uh, keep, keep at it. Um, I just wanted to maybe move a little bit to sort of more the kind of leadership you know, perspective, which you, you have a lot of a lot of a lot of thoughts on. Um, I think I've heard that sort of when you came in as, as CEO in, in, in 2018, that you sort of pursued this kind of culture of unbossing, right? To kind of you know sort of ease the you know the, sort of the, the Swiss clockwork, so to so to say. Um, like, what does it mean to sort of unboss, or what, what does that, that look like in a, in, a, in a practical way? Yeah, you know, unbossing is, is, a, is a new word for an old concept, the concept of servant leadership, which goes back centuries. And it's underpinned by a fundamentally a belief that human beings are, when properly inspired, are fundamentally going to work tirelessly towards a mission. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, your job is to create clarity. Uh, try We say draw the lines on the tennis court or the soccer pitch, create clarity, create the expectations, clarify the strategy, and then get out of your people's way and be about removing obstacles rather than exerting control. And the pandemic has been a beautiful example of forcing our leaders to have to give up a lot of control because you don't have a lot of the control levers. And what we found is people work even harder, right? When at home, they work even harder than they did at the office. If anything, we're trying to get people to just take a break and take care of themselves and their health and well-being. But the unboss is really capturing the energy of the human spirit mm -hmm. and saying, we're going to inspire, motivate, remove obstacles, but it's not our role to command, control, and have the answers. Right. And we found that to be a very powerful uh, approach, but it goes back. I mean, it goes back. My favorite book on the topic is the Tao Te Ching, which mm -hmm. is uh, centuries and centuries old, um, millennia old. And the same perspectives of the kind of a, an unboss or servant leadership are found in that book, you know, from... Fifth, fourth, fifth century BC. Yeah, and that's a good recommendation for uh, you know people to take home this weekend. I yeah. think that, uh, that 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 very good. And um, no, I was I was also kind of so, so you, you're a, you're a very young CEO of a of a of a of a, of a, of a Swiss company. Uh, you mentioned before that sort of when you came in, you know, everyone was sort of very you know, in their suit and tie. And you know, since then, you mentioned it was a bit of a uh, you know the sort of casual arms race, <laughs> so exactly. so to say. Um, but like, how, how do these kind of small things play? Or is 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 that like you know? I guess a lot of people could say, well, that's that's tokenism. Yeah. Uh, or or but does or does it play a bigger role? Yeah, I, I think I think symbols matter. And when you learn when you want to create a cultural transformation, symbols matter. And when we want to say that we're a humanistic company where people are treated as equals, we respect one another's perspectives, we want people to speak their minds. We have to remove the barriers. Those barriers, I sit in open space and let's see what happens after the pandemic <laughs> on my office even will we'll evolve at, at that moment. Yeah. But you want to remove those physical walls. Right. Then you want to remove the walls of, well, people wearing suits and ties to create hierarchies in the organization. It's been interesting to watch as Microsoft Teams and Zoom have, have actually created another equalizer where everybody's just a box on, on the screen. Mm -hmm. But those things matter. I think they matter in the human mind uh, to, to remove those obstacles. And when you can do that, you create a place where 
people are very open, share their ideas, and you get to, to better ideas. Um, I conduct regular now virtual coffee chats with co uh, colleagues all around the world. And it's amazing, the conversations. And people will give me very direct feedback in an open way, which wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago in this mm -hmm. company, because they see me as just another human being who happens to be the leader of their company, but also is first and foremost a human being just like them, with all of the good and the bad that comes with that. Yeah, and yeah, no, that's really interesting. You mentioned like, sort of that on, you know, on video chat, everyone is a little, a little box on, 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 a, on a screen. And I think we also kind of found it in, at, at DeepMob, like in our company, that you know, then all of a sudden, if you have meetings like this, you know, some people are able to speak up much more, or you, know, you kind of Absolutely. create a bit of an equal playing, playing field because of all of our people we work with are you know, engineers, and you know, they might not be sort of the most forthcoming people in a, in a, in a personal conversation. Like, is that something that you've, you think is an advantage of, 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 the, of, the, of the pandemic? I mean, I think it's gonna be a, a, always a balance between all of these different you know, elements. On the one hand, it's, a, it's a definitely an advantage, it's an equalizer. On the flip side, we've also learned that social capital matters so much in an organization. The ability to meet one another, uh, the ability to build those bonds, the ability to have the off-the-cuff conversation. So the question, of course, is how can this hybrid, mm -hmm. the so-called hybrid way of working, how can we get the best of both worlds? We haven't figured it out, but we're certainly quite committed to it. But I keep asking myself, how do we create an environment where our people have energy, more energy, can multiply one another's energy, and not get, get so caught up with, oh, you need to spend two days in the office versus three days in the office. And I don't think that's the answer. I think the answer is more asking, how can people reach their full potential in our organization? Mm. That's the environment we want to create. Amazing, great, great stuff. Let, let's go to some questions from, from, from the audience. Um, but we have one, one on here. Um, how do you reconcile trust with profit in the perspective of your stakeholders' interests? Yeah, so this is a topic now more than ever as stakeholder cap, so-called stakeholder capitalism has, has, has risen up. Um, there, there are some great, I think, books that uh, I've, I've, refle I've read and reflected on and looked at the history of capitalism. Actually, in, in the whole goal of, of companies and capitalism is to serve society in the pursuit of profit-making endeavors. It, it should be one and the same. So I don't see them in conflict. If we do our role well, if the medicines we create in our world at least matter for the world or are provided in a responsible way, we'll be able to profit from that. And at the same time, society benefits by better health, better lifespans, people benefit, and the trust is increased. So I think that the, the real magic is not in looking at this as conflict, but mm -hmm. really looking at it as two parts of the same overall equation where, where we're trying to progress. And uh, you know, when you think about it as a company, we have to maximize human capital, financial capital, environmental capital, social capital. All of these sources of capital have to be properly managed for a company to succeed like ours has for many centuries. Mm -hmm. and that's what we have to think about as leaders. Right, so did you think that that often creates like kind of an, an opposition like between sort of, you know, what's socially good and what's sort of capitalist good. Do you, do you think that's a sort of false dichotomy? I, I think it's a false dichotomy. I think if we do our jobs well, if we find incredible medicines and get them to people all, in, or all around the world, then it's one and the same. And we profit from it mm -hmm. and, our, and our shareholders profit from it. Great. I hope that some political leaders are, are listening. <laughs> that, uh, um, we have another question up here. Um, how is progress developing towards personalized medicine? Yeah, it's, personalized medicine became a, a kind of catchphrase, and I think we're making a lot of progress, but in, if we mean by personalized medicine down to the individual patient, that's proving to be very challenging. I mean, we're still not at a place where we can understand human biology to the point where we can directly personalize. And we have to understand, it's worth reflecting for a moment for the audience, I love telling the story, that we are trillions of cells, and those cells evolved over billions of billions of years. And the complexity of a one human body is absolutely immense. And then if you add on top of that, the genetic code of the bacteria that live on our bodies or inside of us exceeds our own genetic code, then, then that means the complexity is just massive. On the flip side, I think we're getting much better at personalizing therapies. And by that, I mean we can take cells out of the body of a child who has cancer, their, their immune cells, reprogram them, and in many cases, cure them of their cancer. So that's a very personalized therapy. Uh, it's a, we call it cell therapy, therapy or 
allogenic cell therapy um, or autogenic cell therapy, and cells are removed, reprogrammed. And that's where we are at the moment. Will it change in the next 20 years? Maybe, but it's still still a lot of work to do. Hmm. No, amazing, amazing. And let's let's go to the to the next one. Um, where will the innovation come from in the next years? Sort of, if you look at small biotech companies, you know, like like BioNTech, or from your know, large pharmaceutical companies like uh, like Novartis. I mean, um, maybe you're slightly biased in answering biased. this question. I am a little biased. But, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll ask some follow-up <laughs> questions if not. Yeah, I, look, I, I think, and you'll find me saying this all the time, as a CEO, I've learned it rarely is it an or, it's almost always an and, and it's navigating the and, it's navigating the polarities. So on the one hand, we have one of the largest research engines in the industry. We invest uh, almost $3 billion a year on basic science research in Novartis. Yet at the same time, 35, 30 to 35% of our medicines come from the biotech sector. So it's probably gonna be both. That, that mix will shift and flex over time. What's clear to me is that to scale technologies, to, to really bring them to patients, you need a scaled organization like ours. Very difficult for a bio. I mean, we run 500 clinical trials and have a massive infrastructure to be able to scale innovations. Mm -hmm. But will the, the original innovation always come from our lab? Certainly not. Mm -hmm. And I think the explosion of the biotech sector, if anything, will mean we have to be even better at partnering with small biotechs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess we saw that a lot with the development of the, of the vaccines as well, and it oh, got absolutely. really into the picture. Um, what, one, one sort of, I guess, sort of shower thought I had this morning when I thought about the chat we were, we were going to have was that, um, you know, like it, it, I read in, in an interview from that, that you gave maybe about a year ago where you said, well, I'll probably take like a bit, you know, maybe two years or something before, you know, the, the COVID vaccine is, is, is ready. And I guess you were also a bit, you know, to some extent, surprised or, you know, positively that they were able to move so quickly through mm -hmm. the clinical trials, right? So maybe just for the audience, um, you know, the, the COVID vaccines, you know, they were, were developed within sort of weeks of us knowing the virus or months. And then you have, you know, the clinical trials of testing because, you know, we're going to use this on humans. So this is, should, be, should, be, should be safe. Um, I guess in terms of in terms of precedent, I, I was thinking sort of one way of, of looking at this is that uh, if we can speed up these clinical trials much more, that would maybe to some extent reduce the defensibility that a you know a big company like Novartis has, right, uh, compared to these sort of small small biotech firms. Is that is that like a, a risk you perceive, or how do you how do you evaluate that? Yeah, you know, I think a um, few points on this point. So first, I think it's worth reflecting, uh, and I have to say, my my comment before was was uh, two years to get to scale. And I still think I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be right. <laughs> Let's see, but I think to get okay. to scale, TikTok is gonna take us about 18 months to two years. But what, what's important to first reflect on, uh, on the COVID vaccine is the sequence of the spike protein was something that the researchers at the US National Institutes of Health had worked on for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we see the top of the iceberg, the uh, rapid creation of the, of the vaccine and the rapid scale up. But behind that, and I, I wouldn't want those scientists to get a, sh a short take because they worked for, for so many years. They were ready with the sequence, right? They, they were able to do this and give it to the vaccine companies, that sequence that then led to, of course, the explosion. So I think that that's, that's worth reflecting on. Now, I, I do think that we've learned a lot during this pandemic. We've learned that in many ways, companies can collaborate much better together on designing clinical trials, not wasting effort in clinical trials collaborating on how we assess different um, uh, projects. Could we apply that, for instance, in cancer? Rather than all of us doing the same cancer trial, could we work together to do a basket trial? Um, that would be so much more efficient, and that would speed up drug development. We've learned that if you can use technology, so-called remote monitoring technology, uh, through it, you had mentioned in your opening comments, uh, telemedicine, et cetera, you can speed up the enrollment of clinical trials mm. dramatically. So I hope that we can take these lessons and hopefully shorten the drug development timeline. I think a great success would be to get from 10 to 12 years to seven to eight years. I just think that it is just, it's worth recognizing how complex it is to solve scientific uh, problems in the body and uh, not to over extrapolate, I'd say from the COVID story. Got it, got it. Now that's, uh, that's definitely a good, a good thing to, to know for, well, people starting biotech companies perhaps. Um, let's go to the, to the next question from, from the audience. Um, the advancements in technology have favored larger economies, but emerging economies, you know, such as India, um, still face the challenges of acquiring and using the technology launched. Um, so how can you, as the CEO of such a large enterprise, 
make a difference to, to these nations, right? Like referring to India and, and sort of, you know, emerging, uh, uh, emerging economies when it comes to access to, 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 to treatments and, and healthcare. Yeah, we've made this, as I mentioned in my comments previously on the trust with society topic, really are one of our top priorities. And we have a whole organization focused on it. Uh, in many parts of the world, we launch access brands. So as one example in India, we treat millions of heart failure patients, some of the highest volumes of heart failure patients we treat of our most latest heart failure medicine are in fact in India because we have found ways to maximize access while preserving value in, in more developed markets. Uh, so we think that's part of the solution. In Africa, we've brought all of our uh, African countries together in a sub-Saharan African unit. And all we do is we ask them to maximize access to medicines. And in maximizing the access to medicines, our goal is, is really to say that if we can maximize access, the business results will follow. Um, so it takes concerted effort. I feel very good about where we are on our access to the, our latest technologies in most of the areas of medicine. The biggest challenge for us now as a company is going to be the new wave of technologies, cell therapies and gene therapies that currently cost a lot uh, to produce. How will we get them the last mile to the patient in Zambia or Tanzania or in India? Um, and so we need to do more work on that front for sure. Mm. I guess very, very topical point right now. Um, let's go to the let's go to the next one. You mentioned scale in order to tackle the big health challenges. Uh, wouldn't it be more efficient to structure a global pool to finance R and D more systematically, and have a pre agreed distribution of the value generated to the participating? Uh, uh, institutions. So I guess it's a sort of a question of like how to manage all this R and D funding. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's a it's an age old question, and and you know I reflect a lot on it because the, there seems to be a lot of power to collaboration and uh, a perceived uh, power maybe to centrally allocating resources. But almost all of the great medicine challenges that have been solved have been solved by the power of the markets. Mm -hmm. uh, and I still believe we should find places to collaborate where it makes sense. Remove the places where there might be duplication or, or unvaluable, invaluable duplication. But what really enabled us to get COVID vaccines was the competition in the market, was biotech companies working relentlessly to solve these problems. The next medicines we're gonna get for COVID is exactly that. And I worry that if we were to go to a central planning mechanism that allocated resources based on uh, perceived knowledge of scientific experts, as opposed to just letting uh, entrepreneurial human spirit drive the innovation, we won't get to the same place. Mm, I got it. And you know, we're almost coming to the, to the end of our, our session, but um, I just want to ask you one thing. You mentioned the age old question, and um, you know, I heard that you actually carry a fossil in your bag. Um, and you mentioned that it helps you to keep a leadership lesson in, in mind. Do you mind sharing that with us? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a big, I'm big on big history and reflecting and trying to keep perspective. So the fossil I have in my bag, uh, actually given to me by a wonderful coach, Aki, Aki Kuppel, um, called, it's called an ammonite. Um, and the ammonite uh, fossils are, were the most abundant creature on the planet 400 million years ago. And then there was a mass extinction and the ammonites went extinct, but you can find these fossils. So it reminds me of a few lessons. One, to stay humble uh, and, and remind yourself that we're all small in the end. I like Carl Sagan's uh, note that we're all made of stardust. And in the end, it's worth keeping yourself humble. My grandmother uh, always taught me that as well. So humility, I think, matters. Second is perspective on, on what we do as a company for us, because we're trying to solve these billion-year-old puzzles of science to create medicines. Um, and to keep that perspective um, in, in mind. And of late, the Ammonite reminds me just to, to be grateful. I mean, mm -hmm. be grateful that life exists at all and that we have these opportunities and grateful to live in places like we do here in Switzerland. I think uh, humility, perspective, and gratitude are powerful things to keep in mind as a leader. Mm. Yeah, and that, 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 I'm curious to bring that kind of to my, as one of my last questions, but you know, if, what, what would you say to 25-year-old Vass, uh, if, you could, if you could speak to him now. <laughs> there are a lot of things I would tell 25-year-old Vass. But I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I would say be okay with failing. You know, I think as a 25-year-old, I was terrified of failing. Mm. And I think in the end, all the failures build character, build uh, capabilities, you learn, you grow. 
Um, I, I would also say keep dreaming. Um, because I was a dreamer then. Along the way, you can lose your dreams. I'm still a bit of a dreamer now, maybe not as much of a dreamer. But I would remind 25-year-old all of you to keep dreaming. Fantastic. I've realized that time, time is up. Um, thank you very much, Vas, for, for joining you. us. Uh, it's been, it's been a, great, a great chat. We can, people can follow you on LinkedIn is where you're yeah, most active. So to keep following your thoughts after this, that's where, uh, where to go and, and Tao Te Ching, uh, yeah. <laughs> of course. Um, and now we're going, uh, we're going back, back to, to the studio, back to uh, Patricia and Maggie to uh, continue the rest of the Singalan Symposium. Thank you very much.